through our inductive reasoning. For instance, you watch the tides. They occur regularly. Okay? Why is this thing so lopsided? You note that down as an observation. High tide, low tide, high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide. You have data. Data is not deductive. Data is inductive. You watch the sun rise here, set there, rise here, set there, rise here, set there. You note that happens every day. You note the tides happen every day. What conclusion could you come to if you watch the tides and you watch the rising of the sun and setting of the sun? It looks like there's order. That could be your conclusion. Nature has order. From that, you would then go to a deductive premise. That's how inductive reasoning helps you get there. The stuff I see, the stuff I measure, leads me to a conclusion. Then I can make a bigger assumption. Right? So let's, let's, uh, let's put that down, because that's important. We can do it. Observations are inductive. Leads to a conclusion. We can come up with more hypotheses, right? And we can find out more scientific facts, right? That's what you're familiar with, hypotheses. This conclusion can also lead us to a deductive premise, which gets us even bigger. Bigger vision, bigger premise, because you don't need data, you just need your mind. So how big can you dream? How big can you think? It's got to make sense based on what you saw. <clears throat> so I saw tides, sunrise, sunset. Could there be other things happening in nature that you haven't observed or recorded? You recorded the tides at the South Carolina coast, Charleston, Myrtle Beach, Hilton Head. You didn't record any tides on the west coast. So you really can't make a conclusion about that, can you? because you haven't measured it. You didn't, you didn't measure or observe any tides in Europe or China. So you can't make a conclusion about that. But what could you do? You could come up with an a priori statement that says nature governs the tides everywhere. based on what you saw. I grew up in New York. I see the sun rise in the east and set in the west. I've been to California. I've seen the sunset in the Pacific coast. But I haven't been in India to see where the sun rises or the sun sets. You see what I'm saying? Deductive thinking allows you to get out of the stuff you haven't seen. 
Let's go to the human body. You've seen a cut heel. You might have broken a bone, had it set, but then it, it cemented itself back together. Those are your two experiences. From that, you could conclude, my body can heal a cut or mend a broken bone. Right? So you can only make scientific conclusions about that. But what could you do with deductive thinking? Could you get out of the box and think bigger? And what would you think about the human body? It has this ability to heal itself all the time. You see how that one little thing, the cut, leads us to something bigger? But we go there and we think for ourselves. So then what happens if I feel a sore throat? If I think my body has the ability to heal itself, what might I do with my sore throat? Let it go. Let my body heal it. What might I do if I have an earache or my child comes down and has a fever? What might we do if we think the body has the ability to heal itself? We might just step back and watch the body heal itself. So that's how we get to our starting point by the things we see. Is that making sense? The things we see lead to our conclusion. The body can heal a cold. The body can heal a cut. All right, my hypothesis might be I'm going to study sore throats and add to my scientific knowledge. But while I'm doing that, I could also say, you know what, I think the body has the nature to heal itself on everything. In the body, we call that the innate intelligence of the body. In terms of what's ordering and giving structure to the universe, we call that universal intelligence. Universal, big, overarching, includes everything. Intelligence, smart. Okay? These two things are important to see how they come together. Another way that you can get to your a priori statement is through faith. I believe God created the world, so of course it's intelligent. Of course it's ordered. Of course it's structured. Most people would probably get to that a priori statement by way of the things they see. It just makes sense. It's common sense. If anybody saw the sunrise and the sunset and the tides, they would say it's common sense that, the, that there's structure in the universe. I don't need to study that. Minor premise has to be connected to the major premise. It helps you get the truth. Here's my major premise. All humans have brown eyes. That's my starting assumption. Am I allowed to do that? Yeah, you can make whatever assumption you want. Could be wrong. 
right? A lot of people like to tell you you're wrong if it doesn't agree with their major premise. How could I make a statement like that? Okay, I've seen myself in the mirror or other people with brown eyes. So that would be faith or induction? That would be induction. You made an observation. So you've seen people with brown eyes. That causes you to make a, a bigger statement that all people must have that. Or you could make that statement based on pure faith. I just say people have brown eyes. I have never seen people, but they got brown eyes. I don't have a mirror to see my eyes, but everybody has brown eyes. Right? Induction seems like it might be a better way to make that statement. Carlos is a human. That's my minor premise. Is it connected to my major premise? Yes, it's connected. Logic has to flow. There has to be a connection. What's your conclusion? Carlos has brown eyes. Human, human, right? Carlos, Carlos, brown eyes, brown eyes. I'm connected. My logic flows. I started with the premise. I meet Carlos. Sure enough, he's got brown eyes. I'm feeling pretty good. My logic makes sense. Until... So you meet somebody that doesn't have brown eyes. Ooh. So if I meet somebody that has blue eyes, they're still human. So my logic is good, but then when I meet them, I realize, oh, they got blue eyes or green eyes. So where's my problem? In the logic? Right? I went from all humans to one human, then then down to their eyes. Where's my problem? Is the problem in my logic? Or is the problem in my premise? Premise. My premise could be the world is organized. Or my premise could be the world, the universe, however you phrase that, is disorganized, is random. And so when we realize that that's wrong, then we go back and correct it so our logic gets stronger. And we draw truth out of that. What did I start with? What did I end with? Deductive logic usually flows from the general to the specific. You think big, you end up small. If I think the universe is organized, then I think everything in the universe is organized, and human beings are in the universe, so they're organized, and you're a human being, so you're organized. And we follow all the way down to the person on our adjusting table. We get very specific with the person on the adjusting table. Correct or reliable inference. Logic. Just if you need, if you need a fancy definition of logic. It is a science. It's a deductive science. It's based on semantic reasoning. When you hear the word semantics, do you usually think that's used in a positive context or a negative context? 
Oh, that's just semantics. Does that sound positive or negative? Sounds negative. But semantics means words have meaning. So when you use certain words, do you mean to use that word? Because that word means something. Right? Mean what you say, say what you mean. Pick the word. I am a father. What's your conclusion? I have children. Or I have at least one child. Are you 100% certain of that? What do you need to do? You need to define the word father. What if I'm a Catholic priest? Catholic priests are referred to as father. No children. So you could have been thinking you were right in your thinking, but you didn't define the word and therefore, your logic didn't make sense. Does chiropractic get results? We've got to define results. We would like 100% certain conclusions, and that's going to require defining our terms. Okay, so what determines if we can have 100% certainty? Before we get to that, I want you to make some observations of that object. Inductive observations using your senses. Anybody? It's black. It's not a chair yet. We're making observations. You used your eyes to tell me the color. It's black. Somebody else. Uh, it has plastic. Your sense of touch. It's got something that would be good for sitting. It's got a flat surface. And if you touched it, it's got a cushion. Observations. One, two, three, four. Four legs. Appears to be sturdy, stable. What about this? It's got something that you could maybe lean on. Sit on, lean on. You have a number of inductive observations. What is your conclusion? This object would be a chair or would be good for sitting. Could you make the conclusion that this would be good for fishing? You could, but it'd be a pretty bad conclusion. It wouldn't make sense with your observation. Could you say, I'm building a house, and I'm going to put this in the wall and use it as a window? No. It's not consistent with your observations. Right? How about taking our observations and making a bigger premise, getting beyond the chair. Things with a flat surface and a back with sturdy legs. Anything that looks like that could be a chair, not just this object. Anything with four legs would provide a sturdy, state, a sturdy base for sitting. Anything with a flat surface and a vertical surface would be good for sitting and leaning on. You get into the bigger picture. 
What if you were to give me some inductive observations about your cell phone? Okay. I touch it and things appear. I swipe it. My granddaughter was like a year and a half old, and she picked up my highly technologically advanced flip phone. And she opened it up and went to swipe it. And you can't swipe on a flip phone. <laughs> and how does a one-and-a-half-year-old even know to swipe? Right? But you know that you can touch it and things appear on the screen. What other observations about your cell phone? It's got glass. It makes noise. Music. I can hear a voice. What might your conclusion be after we come up with a bunch of observations, since you don't want to play, about a cell phone? Communication. I can talk into it. People hear me. I hear people talking back to me. It gives me music. I can read, which is another form of communication. Right? We might not say that this is a good thing for communication, unless you really wanted to make a point by throwing it. You would not come to the conclusion that your cell phone is good to sit on, although many of you do. Based on your inductive observations, you make different inductive conclusions. But you can also get even bigger. Right? The computer screen said, look at all this stuff that we can do. So getting into the bigger deductive picture, somebody said, you know what? If we can design anything like that for communication, we can make them as big or small as we want. And hence you had the evolution of the cell phone, which started out as the, the desktop computer, which started out as the big mainframe computer that needed a whole room to house it. Because people got out of the box and they thought in a bigger picture based on what they had observed and what they knew they could do. So what observations could we take this now to some, to some living things? What do you observe about a tree? Leaves fall off in the fall, in the autumn. Before they do that, they turn different colors. Do they? Are those ne are those leaves or needles? They're still considered a tree. Right. The ones with needles don't seem to drop off, although they do. They just don't lose them all. But that's what makes the forest floor so soft is all those needles. Something else about a tree. It's got roots, and the roots always go down. And the branches, some of them come out and look for water in the air. Go down to Savannah, some neat stuff there. The leaves, the branches, go up. In the summertime, they're green, spring. A lot of observations. Could we come up with a conclusion about a tree? For one thing, we could, we could call it a tree, come up and name it. We could say that it provides materials for other things. And if we get out of that picture, we can talk bigger and bigger. And we've already talked about human beings, the stuff we've seen it do. We haven't measured everything, but if it can do this, why couldn't it do that? Why can't it handle your headache if it can handle your sniffle? Why can it handle a stomach ache if it can handle a headache? How much time do we want to give it to handle things on its own? So this just gets us into the realm of deductive thinking, which gets us from something big down to something specific. And the most specific thing is you, the potential client in somebody's office. How do we get to this general starting point? through inductive observations. We'll be talking more about that.
So if you want to be certain, and I'm thinking everybody in here would like to be certain that they've helped somebody, then you have to have a good premise and good reasoning. Those are the two requirements for you to be 100% certain. If my science of how I know you're subluxated tells me when and where to adjust, and I adjust, and then I do my science to tell me that you're now clear, the subluxation is gone, then I am 100% certain you are better off when you leave my office. And I like being certain. I've done my pre-check, I've done my post-check, I've seen the change. I know you're better off 100%. But, Doc, it still hurts here. Or, Doc, it's still sore over here. But my science tells me you're clear. My deductive reasoning tells me you're good. Because I didn't adjust you based on how you felt. I adjusted you based on the science of what I found. My deductive logic tells me you're in a better place. But I have no symptoms. My child has no symptoms today. Well, if I come up with these scientific parameters that tell me she's, your, your child is subluxated, my deductive thinking tells me I'm certain she needs an adjustment. I would like for you to be certain. I would like for you to be scientific to know about your technique. So, so what happens if we have no experience with the, the child's fever, but we think life is organized and can heal itself? So we let the baby's fever run and you don't do anything. What could you learn? What new truth did you discover? The body can handle fevers. The body can handle infections. If you never give it that opportunity, you never can come to that conclusion. We did this already. What did we discover in this eye color example? That all humans don't have brown eyes. I went back and changed my premise to all humans don't have the same color eyes. So, let's bring this home to chiropractic. Fill in the blank. Top blank. Oh, before we do that, did you have who who came to speak with you Thursday? Doctor D'Onofrio from New Jersey. I hope you forgive him for that. What did he talk about? He shouldn't have done that. He he used to be in the classroom and he misses being in the classroom, which is why I like to get him in here when I can. I gave him three choices on topics that he could address. I'm, I'm testing to see if he picked one of them. Future of healthcare? That wasn't one of them. Salutogenesis? He likes to talk about that. That's not one of the choices I gave him. No, he, he said, he said, yeah, he gave me three choices, but... It's about par for the course. He didn't go into anything else, did he? Good. Good. We'll pick up on him later on. A misaligned vertebra occludes an opening. Occlude means partially blocks an opening. That's your premise. If I have two bones that form a joint, okay, but specifically a vertebra, there's openings on them. If they move at a place misaligned, 
they're going to change that opening. That's my premise. So then, if an occluded opening, am I connected to the first line? Occluded, occluded. Puts pressure on a nerve. And if a nerve under pressure causes, come on, you know why people come to the chiropractor? It causes pain. That's why they come to the chiropractor. Then what's your conclusion? Then a misalignment causes pain. It has to all be connected. It has to be connected to be good logic. So does that make sense to you? A misaligned vertebra occludes an opening. The opening is occluded. There's pressure on a nerve. There's pressure on a nerve. It causes pain. The misalignment causes pain. That flows. That makes sense. Nine people come into your practice on a Monday morning and they all have pain and you find this misalignment including the opening, putting pressure on the nerve, you adjust it, their pain goes away, you're feeling pretty good. Until what? Until you determine somebody needs the adjustment and the pain doesn't go away. Now what do I do with my logic? Or what's another scenario? I find the misalignment occlusion and assume the pressure, but you don't have pain, like many children. Now my logic doesn't work. But I knew they needed that adjustment because my science told me they had interference. But now I'm not so certain. What do we do? A misaligned vertebra includes an opening. An occluded opening puts pressure on a nerve. A nerve under pressure doesn't function properly. Now what's my conclusion? Do you have the same conclusion as before? Anybody? I concluded before the misalignment causes pain. What's my conclusion this time? Causes dysfunction. Causes malfunction. Causes improper function. that might be a little bit more certain than causes pain. We could also conclude nerve under pressure causes interference. Therefore, the misalignment causes interference. Now that might be a little bit more congruent with what my science is telling me. And therefore I can be more confident in my reasoning. We don't want you to be uncertain. You'll say, well, I got science. I want to just do what the science tells me to do. And we're going to talk about that in tomorrow. Maybe a little bit today, but mostly tomorrow. So we learn new things when we go through deductive reasoning. In fact, that's what the old ancient Greeks that you've heard about in philosophy classes, Hippocrates, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they used deductive reasoning. They didn't do science. They said deductive reasoning was more important and valuable than inductive science. When did that all start to change? when we started to move into Rene Descartes, right? Car Co Cartesian coordinates, 
We started to measure different things in the 1500s and the 1600s. Science started to grow. We started to say, hmm, maybe science gives us some answers. Observation gives us some answers. And we're in an era now where we rely entirely on science and we forget to think about the big picture. So, the major premise of chiropractic. There is, go back to, when was the last time we met? Monday? Tuesday. Go back to last Tuesday's notes. There's universal intelligence where? In all matter, what does it do? It gives matter its properties and actions, causing it to causing it to maintain it in existence. As a chiropractor, you should look at that premise and say, do I agree with that or not agree with it? And if you do or you don't, why? Most people would say, I would agree with it based on what I've seen. I've seen order. I've seen structure. I haven't seen chaos. Why do some people not want to embrace that as part of chiropractic? Sounds like you're talking about God. I'm pretty happy with my religion. I don't need a new God. Or I wanted to study something scientific. I didn't want to study something religious. But chiropractic is not a religion. It just recognizes that there's something intelligent about this universe we live in. There's something intelligent about your body. Now, could that intelligent appearance come from God? Yes. But we don't talk about that. As a profession, we don't talk about that. As a person, you probably should think about that. But as a profession, we don't. Because this is a philosophy, science, and art. So what are the two ways that a person could accept this major premise? How would you accept it? Based on this or this? What are the two this is? I heard. Sergio? Observation. Observation, which is induction. Or faith. Most people would accept that any premise based on either induction, observation, or faith. Could you practice and be a chiropractor without accepting our major premise? Yes, many chiropractors do. You get a license. It says you're a chiropractor. You have a diploma that says you, you have a doctorate in chiropractic. You can go practice chiropractic and not have anything to do with the major premise. Some people would say, well, then you're not really doing chiropractic. But you have all the evidence that you are. You have a degree and you have a license. You might be doing a different style of chiropractic then. So if you don't accept the major premise, what is the danger in that? Well, what happens if you think the universe is not intelligently put together? then the things in the universe are not intelligently put together. And this person on my adjusting table is something in the universe, therefore this person is not intelligently put together. 
Therefore, what do I need to use to make them better? My education. Educated intelligence will now rule the world. Below up. Bottom up thinking. We think that we know all the answers. That's bottom up thinking because we think the universe is not intelligent. Now I might want to put ice on your ache or pain instead of adjust and allow your body to heal. Now I might want to prescribe drugs if I was a medical person to make your body be better because your body's wrong. Now those symptoms must be an accidental mistake and we need to control them outside in. So if you follow the logic, the, the premise will help you to decide the kind of doctor that you want to be. And it's not good, bad, right or wrong. It's different world views. Am I thinking above, down, inside, out? Am I thinking outside, in, below, up? Am I a mechanist, a vitalist? Where am I on those two scales? Just think about it. Take the time to think about it and choose the path you want to go down. And then be good at it. Okay, we'll do strengths and weaknesses. What's today? Monday? Tomorrow.